Your Academic Skills Center presents this video series to help you strengthen your statistics skills. Hello, STAT students, and welcome to the Chi-Square video presentation. My name is Janine Allwright, and I am the Instructional Specialist at Walden's Academic Skills Center, where I lead the statistics tutoring team. In this video presentation, we're going to engage with the last inferential test in this video series, the non-parametric test chi-square. Of course, I'm going to remind you that we are working with a limited sample data set to answer a research question about the greater population. I will address the basics of the chi-square test, including how this non-parametric test compares to the other parametric tests that we have addressed in this video series. I will explain the two assumptions of this test, offer an SPSS example that I will fully interpret, and I will be sure to tell the full story of the data. Now let's get started. As always, we will be using data from a limited data set, run it through an inferential statistics test process to answer the question about the greater population. And although the chi-square is a non-parametric test, it still fits firmly within that group of inferential statistics tests. Let's talk about the basics of the chi-square test. A chi-square test is what we call a non-parametric test. It doesn't make use of those parameters that we have been working with in earlier videos in this series. All the tests that we used here were parametric. The literature says that if you have a choice, it's always better to use a parametric test because you will reduce the likelihood of making a type 2 error. Remember, a type 2 error is when you accidentally accept the null hypothesis, so you could be missing a relationship that actually exists in nature by using a non-parametric test. But there might be moments when variables do not fit parametric approaches, and we are offering such an example here in this video presentation when we are working with categorical variables. But it's also very well possible that in nature you could have variables that are terribly skewed, or that you're breaking homogeneity of variances and other assumptions are broken. And you do not want to continue working with a parametric test under those conditions either, because that will lead you to increase the chance of making a type 1 error. And that is accidentally rejecting that null hypothesis and finding relationships that are not really there in nature. Nonetheless, a non-parametric test has limited assumptions, but also limited power. If a robust parametric test can fulfill assumptions, it will always have more power than a non-parametric test. Now, the chi-square test requires categorical variables. They're actually of a specific categorical nature, that's nominal variables. It is possible that you're being asked to run the chi-square for variables that are of an ordinal nature. There are different tests that are better fitting there, but if you're asked to run a chi-square on that, that's okay, because even if a variable has the ordinal nature, ordinal level of measurement, it still fulfills that nominal nature as well. The purpose of a chi-square is to find a relationship that we can quantify. We're actually just comparing observed values, frequencies, to expected values. Now let's talk about the chi-square assumptions. There are really only two assumptions. The first assumption is that you must trust that the researcher collected the data in such a way that left these observations independent, and that we have a sample size that is large enough to really use this test. If our sample size is too small, you cannot trust the result of this test and you cannot interpret this test. The sample size in this assumption is not measured by full number, but is actually assessed by looking at the expected values. We hope that at least 20% of the expected values are smaller than 5. And when we run this test in SPSS, I will share with you how you evaluate the sample size assumption. 
This is how we will set up the test in SPSS. Of course, we will be working with nominal variables. We will enter one variable into the column and the other one into the row because we're building a cross tab. Though one can argue that this is a relationship test, so it doesn't matter much which one is the IV and which one is the DV, the literature says that it's better to put the outcome variable in the column. And we're going to address that one assumption. We'll evaluate significance as always, and then we will interpret the effect size for this test. And this test actually comes with two effect sizes based on the size of the table that we create. If we have two variables that both have two levels, our table will be two by two, and we will interpret the phi. If we have a table of a different size, we will interpret the Kramer's V. As I just mentioned, the chi-square is a relationship test, and I have a chi-square research question example ready here on this slide. My two variables are gender and heart attack diagnosis. To what extent are gender and heart attack diagnosis related? The alternative hypothesis will state what we are expecting. We are expecting that these two variables are related. And of course, the null hypothesis will deny that relationship. Now with that, let's get started with an example in SPSS. And here is the CDC data set that I've shown before. If you have viewed other videos in this series, then surely this must look familiar to you. This is called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. I have that first variable here that you saw on that earlier research question. It is a variable that measures whether somebody has been diagnosed with a heart attack. It's a nominal variable with three levels. One is for yes, two is for no, and seven is for don't know or not sure. That is not an unreasonable answer for such a question. The second variable is the respondent's gender. It has two levels at the nominal level, uh, male and female, and that will produce a two by three table. While I'm not exactly going to assign IV and DV because this is a relationship, right? It works two ways. The gender is going to act as my independent variable, and I'm going to measure whether it has a relationship with that outcome variable ever diagnosed with a heart attack. And to that end, let's run an analysis with these two variables analyze descriptive statistics. My chi-square test lives under the cross tabs function here. Let's bring my gender variable over into the row. I'm going to drag and drop that over. And my heart attack variable, whether you've ever been diagnosed with a heart attack, will be placed in the column because to me that is more of an outcome variable. Let's click on the statistics button. I'm going to ask for the chi-square, of course, but I also want to set up my phi and Kramer's V. Of course, this is a two by three table. I will not interpret the phi. I'm going to interpret the Kramer's V, but they come in a pair. Click continue. Now I will click my cells button here. And the observed count has already been selected by default, but I'm also interested in learning about the expected count. As I mentioned earlier, this chi-square is nothing more than a comparison of the observed frequency to the expected frequency. But I do need my expected frequencies on the screen because I want to know how they come out in order to evaluate that sample size assumption, remember? But I want to mention here, the expected count is actually a formula that's applied behind the scenes. The observed count is available here in the data set. Those are the numbers that you see in the data set. I'm going to compare that to that calculated number and SPSS takes care of that. In the real world, you might even find direction on how to calculate the expected count for real life examples on what other researchers have discovered. But here we will have to do with that formula behind the scene. Now, percentage wise, I like to see row, columns and total. I like to be as generous as I can there because I'm going to use these totals and these numbers in the row and the columns to somewhat describe my variables. I can now click continue and I'm ready to run the test. Click OK. 
First things first, I want to describe my variables. I can see how the distribution is happening here between males and females, but I can also add those yes, no, and don't know groups to it and give a picture, paint a picture, if you will, for your audience to explain how these variables act here on this data set. I don't encourage you to project every number here, every row, but you want to kind of summarize this as you move forward. Let's evaluate this chi-square box because this is where the assumption of sample size is being answered. I can see here, written in a sentence below the chi-square test box, that no cells have an expected count less than five, so I have no issue with the sample size. So assumption is fulfilled, but let's take a look really at these expected counts and we can see that they are all nicely above five. There is no issue here with those expected counts. They all look good, but then I have a generous sample size. This p-value for the Pearson chi-square is significant, p smaller than 0 0.001. You're going to need that chi-square value and the degrees of freedom, of course, to write this up. And now that I find significance, I can interpret this by using the Kramer's V. Again, this is a two by three table. The phi would not fit. Kramer's V is 0.121. And we're going to use that threshold value slide, if you will, that effect size slide. And here it is. The Kramer's V is on there between 0.2 and 0.6. Let's check again in SPSS what that number was. 0.121, this is weak at best. And that will be the gist of the story, really, because this is a very weak test. It truly only looks for a very simple relationship. And then it's nothing like the complicated inferential test that I presented in earlier videos in this video series. Now, moving forward. I have the same tables on the screen here that I showed you in SPSS earlier. And you can see here what is important in the output. You want to use some of that information to describe how your variables act on this data set. And you want to evaluate the expected frequency here to fulfill that assumption. You can see that these expected frequencies here are well above five. So no problem there. Let's move to the inferential test results. And I have that arrow already aligned here with that assumption because your assumption is once more confirmed. You don't have any cells that have expected counts less than five. The threshold value here percentage wise is 20%. Anything above 20% will make these test results unreliable and you cannot interpret them. Assumption is fulfilled. Here comes my chi-square. Evaluate that against the alpha level of 0.05 and you have significance. And now I'm going to interpret the Kramer's V because this is a two by three table. 0.121 is weak at best. Now you will need to bring additional information here. You need the value of the chi-square and the degrees of freedom to write this up in a proper APA way. And with this last show of the tables in SPSS, and with a mention of which numbers are important for your write-up, this video presentation for the chi-square has now come to an end. Thank you for watching this video presentation. If you have course-level statistics questions, reach out to our stats tutors at statsupport at mail.waldenu.edu or view our statistics support resources at academicskills.waldenu.edu.